was small, which leads to all kinds of inappropriate innuendo. It's not true, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, look, thank you very much for the opportunity to come and talk to you today. Um, what I want to do today is give you uh, a snapshot of how the whole landscape of communicating science in particular, but communications in general, has changed, and how you as researchers can <coughs> take that to your advantage in getting the message out about the research that you're doing. Uh, a lot of that will be based around uh, the ultimate, uh, Australia's Science Channel, which is run by the Royal Institution of Australia, that's the organisation I'm the director, CEO of. Um, and in a brilliant example of perfect preparation prevents piss poor performance, mm -hmm. I managed to leave my presentation back at the hotel room. <laughs> so uh, I've managed to cobble together some. Uh, sites on the internet which will illustrate what it is that I want to get across to you. Um, then, once I've talked for about half an hour or so, I'd like us to start looking into some workshop type activities. So, uh, I'll be looking to you specifically to think about what sort of communications you would like to do around your research, most importantly, why you want to do that and who you want to talk to. And then we'll go through some exercises in how you might actually construct appropriate messages for those particular communication streams. It's not complicated, folks. If it was difficult, I wouldn't do it. I'm that kind of guy. And if I can do it, <coughs> then anybody can do it. Um, so let's get started. The modern online environment has changed everything with regards to the way that uh, people can talk to people. Uh, if you had a look at the old media environment last night and you followed Q&A, um, last night Professor Brian Cox was pitted against the new Senator from Queensland, uh, Malcolm Roberts. And Malcolm Roberts is obviously a nut job from the Tim Ford <laughs> Brigade, who is denying that climate change, uh, that there's any evidence for it. Uh, Brian Cox, of course, is a science communicator <coughs> extraordinaire, uh, who was able to actually provide all of that evidence so that uh, Roberts could <coughs> deny it on camera. Um, I sat there as an Australian citizen embarrassed that in 2016 the discourse around something as fundamental to our future as climate change is reduced to a puppet show on television. That debate should have ended 20, 30 years ago and yet it's still being perpetrated largely because of the workings of the old media environment. Now, by the old media environment, I mean basically everything before online was invented, everything before the internet, television, radio, newspapers, the old media world. And the part of the problem is that the old media world operates on a completely different basis from actually telling you what's going on in the world. It's about entertainment. It's not about communicating science. Now, take the program that I used to work for, Catalyst. It bills itself as Australia's premier science program on television. And it is that, but it's not a science program. It's entertainment. Like everything else on the television, it is entertainment. Why? Because all of the competition <coughs> is entertainment. Have a look at what Catalyst is up against tonight. Uh, he, here we are, Catalyst at 8 o'clock on a Tuesday night. We're up to uh, up against the Olympics down on Channel uh, on Southern Cross. Um, and because of the Olympics, everybody else has just given up putting anything on the television. But when I <coughs> was on Catalyst, my main competition, it wasn't Mythbusters, 
it wasn't science docos on SBS. My main competition was Getaway, because it was in exactly the same time slot as uh, Catalyst. And there was a large part of the audience that are sitting there at home with their finger on the remote button. And unless I put in all the effort to be as appealing and as entertaining as Catriona the Roundtree, they would flick over to Getaway. And that is the thought that is going through the head of all the television executives. And I know if it's a choice for me to make between watching myself on television and watching Catriona Roundtree, I know it's a really simple equation. So, the thing with the old media environment when it comes to communicating science is as researchers, you would think the proposition is quite simply that you have a story to tell to all of these people over here, the audience. How do you do that? Well, under the old media model, what it would be was that you would take your story to a journalist, someone like me on Catalyst, and as soon as you did that, it ceased to become your story. It actually becomes the property of the journalist and the organisation they work for. <clears throat> and the organisations that employ the journalists are big corporates. Even the ABC can think of as a big corporate. It's an expensive corporation in order <coughs> to be able to run a television station. You know, uh, not just employing journalists, but all of the capital equipment that's required, the transmission towers, yada, yada, yada. It's big business. And they're in business not to tell stories. The way they stay in business is so appetizing, so they want the biggest possible audience they can get. And if their way of getting the biggest possible audience is to take your story and make you look stupid, that's exactly what they'll do. And just think, uh, uh, I, I, I will open, openly offer the challenge tonight. Watch A Current Affair, or watch, um, what's the one on Channel 7, buddy? It's uh, Today, Tonight. <clears throat> watch either of those programs, and I guarantee there will be an episode or, or a story on there which will involve a bit of science, it will involve a bit of a boffin coming a board in for commentary, and if the TV execs think that they're going to get more bums on seats making that boffin look stupid, that's exactly what they're going to do. Because that's their job. That is the failing of the old media environment. But now, we live in a new media environment. We live in an online environment where you as researchers can go directly to the audience. If you have a computer connected to the internet, you can create a global audience. Now, throw into this mix the fact that the technology that's required, as I'll be showing you a little later, I can go out with my mobile phone and shoot and edit a whole story of a quality that when I was back on Catalyst, it took uh, a dozen people and about half a million bucks worth of equipment to make over a period of about a month. I can go out and shoot and edit the whole story on my iPhone uh, with a couple of little extra gadgets that I've bought along the way. Uh, but I can do that, pull it all together on the phone, edit it all up and have it back in the office within the day. That kind of flexibility that opportunity to talk to the world is being taken up by many researchers and many other people. And some people have been brilliantly successful at it. Bell Gibson built a multi-million dollar empire around the claim that she had, had cancer when she didn't. And so she set up uh, an online channel which was all about promoting her diets and her books and her paraphernalia. She made a squilling out of it before she was busted and they found out that she didn't actually have cancer ever. You had people like Je uh, Jessica Aniscourt, who had a terrible cancer that eventually killed her. But when she uh, was diagnosed and when the doctor said, look, there's nothing we can do other than radical surgery, 
and she said, oh, well, I don't want to do radical surgery. She went away and she took up a thing called Grierson therapy, which involved coffee enemas, and I've still yet to find out if they cool the coffee down first. <laughs> um, and all kinds of weird dietary regimes. She built up an empire of people following this, so much so that when her mother developed breast cancer, her mother steered away from conventional therapy and went on to gear some therapy and she was dead within two years. And that empire built by Jessica, who now has died herself from her cancer, again, it was a multi-million dollar international uh, business, all created by an online environment. Look at uh, Peter Evans and the paleo diet. It's the same phenomenon. Look at um, the food babe, as she calls herself, puts out absolute nonsense, completely scientifically implausible statements such as the air inside the cabin <coughs> of the airplane is recycled from the engines and contains more than 50% nitrogen. <laughs> Don't disappoint me, guys. You should be on the floor in tears of sorrow that such crap can not only be perpetrated on the online environment, but be used as a basis to set up a multi-million dollar business. That's what Food Babe is. She's a multi-million dollar online business. I think it's time that people with real knowledge, such as yourself, learn from these charlatans and actually use the online environment to our own good to tell the world what it is that we're actually doing. Now there is a problem with that. <laughs> There's a lot of researchers who've got a lot of things to say and they're out there on this, I call it the sea of mediocrity. <laughs> no one with the best will in the world could sit down and read every blog that's generated every day. There's just simply far too many of them. Or watch every video blog or listen to every podcast. And so how do you as a researcher get your message to an audience when you're lost in this sea of mediocrity? And that's where I think what I call islands of excellence are important. Australia's Science Channel it is one such island of excellence, and this is the island of excellence online for science. Some of the old world media um, players have created islands of excellence. So, for instance, the ABC online presence is still a place that you go to for trusted uh, information. Uh, there's quite a few of the old world uh, media structures that didn't survive that translation to the online environment. Um, and there have been completely new media players such as Mamma Mia uh, that have uh, evolved <coughs> as islands of excellence. And what these islands of excellence do, they are hubs, they are gateways whereby they can bring together blogs created by other people. They can aggregate content around a subject so that if you're out here in the audience and you're looking for the latest and greatest in science, you'll go to one of the islands of excellence and that's where you'll pick up what the researchers are actually doing. So the proposition for Australia's Science Channel to researchers like you is we want to take your story, we want you to make your own stories and we will take them and present them to the world. Now, there is a commitment that you need to sign on to for that. And that is, if we take your message to the world, because of the nature of the online environment, the world can come back and ask you questions. So that it's no longer just science communication. Don't think that we're going to let you stand on your soapbox and bang on about your favourite subatomic particle. Those days are gone. Now, Tell the world about your favourite subatomic pilot. But be prepared <coughs> to answer what they want to know about your subatomic particle. Be prepared to interact. Be prepared not for communication, 
but for engagement with the audience. And we can do all of this through Australia's Science Channel. We are established as a small organisation, 20 full-time children people, so based in Adelaide, in the old Stock Exchange building in Adelaide, which is now being remodelled and redesigned as the Science Exchange. In there, amongst other things, we have a dedicated studio which can seat 108 people, which we can, it's got a bar in it, which is really important, particularly if you're living in Adelaide, surrounded by such incredible wines. And we can hold events there. We're sitting on the biggest op optical pipe in the country. We can live stream them to the world. Uh, we, can, we have in that studio five high-definition robotic cameras which can record anything that's going on there so we can edit it up and put out professional, high-quality uh, content that way. Some of the fun things that we did uh, last year, we had Brian Box in discussion with me on our studio floor and we live-streamed that to 16,500 school kids across Australia and New Zealand. And those school kids were asking questions directly live with Brian Cox, no matter where they were in the country. So it was a 16,500 kid school room, which spanned the whole of the country and New Zealand. One of my favourites, a couple of years back, we held World Vasectomy Day, <laughs> where live on camera we de dedicated six hours of live programming. The highlight of which was 17 vasectomies performed on camera. I was not one of them. <laughs> Although I was, subsequently I thought, actually, that's a really good idea. But anyway, um, there, there's no other media outlet on the planet that would be prepared to take that risk. Certainly not give over six hours uh, to watching some guys get their nuts chopped. But we were able to use those little visual spices to fill six hours of content around men's health, family <coughs> planning issues, world population pressures, all kinds of really important issues. And because of the vasectomies, that footage was picked up by Reuters and put into every newsroom on the planet. So we had global interaction <coughs> through what was going on in Adelaide. Because we can, we can do that. That's, that. that's part of the luxury. We had a live video cross conversation with the guys at Mawson Base in Antarctica. And because we were live streaming that, that conversation was picked up across Europe and across the United States. We had people across the United States and across Europe asking questions through me in Adelaide of people in Antarctica, you know, all in real time. So we can literally do global broadcasts through our facilities. Australia's Science Channel is a 360 degree vision online platform. What that means is it's not just video on demand. Well, the centerpiece are the video productions, not only that we make, but also video productions that we bring in from outside sources. We also uh, create and aggregate uh, written blogs, and we can uh, create and aggregate uh, podcasts. Any format, even mixed media formats, we can all put them out through Australia's Sun's channel. So, for instance, uh, on the aggregation side, uh, we have agreements with most major universities. I think we're in discussions with CDU on a content sharing basis so that uh, video produced by you guys comes straight over to us and we'll put it out to the world through Australia Science Channel. Uh, one of those arrangements with the University of New South Wales, for instance, gives us access to programs from, uh, that they create on University of New South Wales TV and we'll put them up on Australia Science Channel. Now, you don't get that kind of content sharing in the old media environment because everyone's in competition with each other. 
But because you can watch this stuff anytime you feel like it, there is a big advantage in the online environment of collaborating and sharing stuff around. So if you look at it from the, the audience perspective, you've got kids who want to learn a bit about human evolution they're unlikely to say, hmm, I must go to University of New South Wales TV and catch up with Darren Kernow's series of brilliant videos about human evolution. But they will think, oh, well, let's go and see what we can find on Australia's Science Channel. That sounds like a good place to start. And there you'll find some of Darren's videos on loan from the University of New South Wales TV. And if you like what you see, sure, go off and watch the rest of the series over on the University of New South Wales television. That way, we all grow our audiences together by sharing content around. It's a completely different environment. It's a, it's a different economy. The old world media, old media, the basis of that economy was the dollar. It had to be because it was so expensive to run. The new media environment, the basic unit is the thought. It's the content. It's the quality of the content by which you decide what you're going to make, what you're not going to make, what you're going to broadcast, what you're going to avoid. Um, <clears throat> we uh, accept written blogs from all kinds of different sources, particularly students, uh, 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 undergraduate students, who are trying to uh, make a name for themselves, get some experience in written communications, which is probably the best way to start on the, the whole gamut of communications. Um, and I was telling you that, that um, you, a, a researcher can now just take their iPhone and make a broadcast quality video production. Let me show you what I mean. This is uh, part of a series I made last year. Uh, it's really difficult trying to drive a mouse when you're looking in the opposite direction. Um, this is a, a video, I, I, I'll just play a bit of it. This was all shot and edited by me on, uh, there it is, on my iPhone. Now, I'm aware I've got 14 years experience at the ABC as a science reporter, the road. learning how to do this kind of stuff. But the point is I'm that you there's none of those skills in South that were not fascinating rocks eminently teachable to intelligent people such as yourselves. My proposition is if I can do this, you can do this. So why don't you think about it next time you're doing some field work? Take your iPhone out and video some key parts of it. Get some nice shots of the landscapes. And if there's something important going on, set your camera up on a tripod. Get yourself a tripod. A tripod is an important piece of extra equipment. Get yourself a, uh, an open tripod, stick it up there, and tell them. You're about to see an example of what I'm talking about. Do a, a piece to camera that explains part of the story. And then, yeah, here's, a, here's a classic piece to camera. Look at what? This is called a drop stun. And it's I know I'm fabulous, but, <laughs> but this is this is easy to do. And you already have most of the equipment. And you've probably got it on your person right now in order to be able to do this. So my challenge to you is go out, do it, and bring the stuff back to me. Uh, we will do whatever we can to... Shut up. We will do whatever we can to... I hate it when I talk back to myself. It's not often that you're, you're in, in that situation. Um, but yeah, uh, so think about what you want to tell the world <coughs> about your research. Uh, and we will, at uh, Australia Science Channel, uh, the Royal Institution of Australia, if we can help you to craft that message, we're quite willing and, and uh, uh, we, we really want to help you do that. And then once you've got something together, we can put it up on the channel, we can take you to the world. Now, that's kind of the overview comments that I wanted to knock off in the sort of formal lecture part <coughs> of the workshop. 
I now want to move on to looking specifically at your communications of your science. Now, are you all science researchers? Hands up if you're not in the science. Okay, what, what, what area are you in? Engineering, environmental engineering. Okay, but well that, that's, that's almost as good as science. That's, that's fine. If, if, if you're an engineer, welcome, I'll just speak slowly. Um, <laughs> I'm engineering. You're engineering? Yeah, I can't have twin that. Um, but look, you know, we are heavily into STEM education, so we do want more material from engineers as well as technologists and mathematicians. Well, we call ourselves Australia's Science Channel. Really, it should be Australia's STEM Channel. It's just that people don't readily identify with STEM. Science is a lot more, a lot easier to get across. When I was an undergraduate student, uh, or postgraduate student, my supervisor, Mike Archer, uh, was always drumming into us that the research that we were doing was funded by the public through their taxes. And that therefore we had an obligation to tell the world, tell that public, tell our, our paymasters what it is that we were doing. Uh, and as the research environment has evolved over the last few years since I was an undergraduate or postgraduate, it's become more crucial that you actually tell the world what you're doing. A classic example, I know of two stories I did on Catalyst, where the researchers subsequently included a DVD of the story I did with them in their ARC grants, and that got them the 10% of points for public outreach and communication, one DVD. So, it really is important that you do communicate your science. What do I mean by communicate your science? I think that the days of, okay, I've got it in my paper in nature, let's go down and see the media unit and see if we can put out a press release. <clears throat> I'm a paleontologist. That thinking predates the dinosaurs, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> in this day and age, you should be thinking about how you communicate your research from the day that you invent and think up your research project. Along the way, how are you going to keep the world abreast of what it is that you're doing? How many of you have got a Twitter account? And how many of you actually tweet on a regular basis, once a week, once a month, what goes on in the lab? <laughs> You know, <laughs> some of the most successful researchers uh, that I know uh, have Twitter accounts, and when you actually go through it, you know, the, the tweets are, had a shitty day in the lab. At least the world knows that you had a shitty day in the lab. Or, had a great day in the lab, and all the results, you know, got some great results, all the experiments turned out. That kind of continuous conversation is now possible through things like Twitter and Facebook, and I would strongly advise that anybody doing any kind of a research project think about incorporating that level of outreach into your communication. Then you go to the next level. Do you want to blog about it? Do you want to write up a longer piece about it? Do you want to make that a video blog? Do you want to make that maybe a regular podcast of what you're doing, of your research or your area of science? That's taking it to the next level. When you get to that level, I think the first question, or there's two questions you need to ask before you dive into it. Firstly, who do you want to talk to? And why do you want to talk to? Because Let's go back to the bad old days of the, of the old world media environment. The idea back then was, I just want to tell the world about what I'm up to. I want everybody to pay attention to this particularly fascinating uh, group of insects that no one's ever heard of. You know, they're bound to find it fascinating. 
in the online environment, that's not going to cut it. Because the old world environment was about broadcasting, getting that message out, getting a message out to the biggest possible audience. Online environment is about narrow casting. It's about appealing to an audience that is reasonably well defined. So you need to identify who it is that you want to talk to and why you want to talk to them. Is it just for their general interest? 